Hello everybody, Mark, aka the Nerdy Punk, Beth again today for a new video. Hope you guys are doing well. It is Oscar week, everybody. Happy Oscar week. Uh, we are approximately five days away from the Oscars. Sunday, March 10th, 7 p.m. Eastern, 6 p.m. Central Time. Definitely tune into the Oscars. Obviously, I think if you're watching this video, you're probably already going to be tuning into the Oscars. Um, but I, I'm super excited. I hope you guys are as well. Really happy to be back into Oscar season and be this close. Uh, it's one of my favorite nights of the year. So looking forward to several videos coming up in the next week on the channel uh, dealing with the Oscars and the best movies of 2023. And today we are kicking off Oscar week by going through my personal favorite top 10 movies of 2023. Now, these are movies that I think should be considered among the best of the year, but they are also my personal picks. That's really the only criteria was what were my 10 favorite movies of the year, and that is where this list came from. So, with that being said, uh, I think 2023 has been a really solid year for movies. Um, I think it is a very deep year. Not quite as deep, perhaps, as last year. I know last year my top uh, films of the year was about... 2022 with the uh, honorable mention list. My honorable mention list is not nearly as long this year. However, I think the movies at the top of this list are so incredible. I think there's been several perfect movies that have come out this year, several close to perfect movies, and just overall I think this is probably the best year for film since 2019. And 2019 will go down as an all-time great year. So I think overall, as moviegoers, we have been spoiled with lots of amazing movies this year. And I've very much enjoyed this year at the movies. All right, with that being said, let's get into the list. I have five honorable mentions, and we are going to get into those right now. First honorable mention, Talk to Me. Uh, one of my favorite horror films of the year, not quite my favorite, but many people consider this to be the best horror film of the year. It's from A24, directed by a couple of former YouTubers, which I think is pretty cool. It's, it's really awesome to see somebody take that leap from content creator on YouTube to actually directing a feature film. And it was overall an incredibly well-executed horror flick. Uh, lots of incredible facial expressions and body horror involved here. It's, you know, kind of a classic demon possession story, but it's done in an interesting, unique way, and I really enjoyed it. I thought it was a very solid horror film. Next film on my honorable mention list is The Zone of Interest. This one I actually just checked out last night, finally was able to purchase it on Amazon to check it out. Didn't come to any theaters near me. This movie, I wasn't sure entirely how to feel about it. It is definitely horrifying. Uh, it deals with intense subject matter with the Holocaust. It basically follows Rudolf Hess and his family who live literally right next to Auschwitz. And Rudolf Hess was the commander of Auschwitz. Um, so very interesting guy that I didn't know a lot about. Obviously, what he did was horrific. Um, but he also kind of presented himself as a normal human, and that's kind of the, uh, the point of this story that Jonathan Glazer is telling. He's trying to, you know, not just look at the Nazis as monsters, because yes, they are monsters, what they did was monstrous, but he's trying to remind us that we're all kind of complicit in some of these evil deeds that our governments do on our behalf. And I think it executed that in a phenomenal way. It's very creative. It does drag a lot, in my opinion. It's a typical Jonathan Glazer movie. If you've seen Under the Skin, uh, which is my favorite movie of his, it's definitely similar vibe-wise. It's very slow. Uh, it takes its time, but it creates such an unsettling environment. And I really liked Zone of Interest. I can't say it's a movie that I'm itching to rewatch, but I definitely admire it uh, for what it does. Next honorable mention is Bo is Afraid, the newest film from Ari Aster starring Joaquin Phoenix, and Joaquin Phoenix delivers a phenomenal performance in this movie. Um, this one I was kind of lukewarm on when I first saw it, but the more it sat with me, the more I've liked it. Uh, it's definitely one of the most bold movies of the year, that's for sure. It's got some incredible visual effects. It's one of the best uh, interpretations of anxiety 
in uh, film, in my opinion, as you kind of feel like what it's like to have anxiety through Joaquin Phoenix's character. Um, definitely kind of a therapeutic film, I feel, for Ari Aster, working through a lot of issues uh, with this script. And there's a lot of really funny moments as well. So I think this was definitely a standout. Next honorable mention is American Fiction, directed by Cord Jefferson. This is his first feature, and it stars Jeffrey Wright, who is nominated for Best Actor at the Oscars. I liked American Fiction a lot. There are elements of it that I didn't care for as much. When it deals with the family drama, I'm not as big of a fan of it. But when it uh, is really in its wheelhouse, I think, is when it's being a social satire and uh, commentary. And I think it does that in a really funny way great way and I really enjoyed American Fiction overall. Jeffrey Wright is fantastic. And then the final honorable mention, the newest film from Wes Anderson, well newest feature film shall I say, Asteroid City. Uh, this released back in the summer and I really enjoyed this film. I think it's one of Wes Anderson's best in a long time. Definitely probably the best since Grand Budapest Hotel. Uh, I don't think I would quite put it above that film because I think that's among his best of all time. But this film, Asteroid City, I think could be placed up there. Um, basically, it's your typical Wes Anderson. It's heavily stylized. Every shot is meticulously created. The production design on this film is out of the park amazing. Uh, overall, it has also kind of an emotional backbone to the story as well, which is sometimes what I think is lacking in some of his work. So I really loved this. I think this is Wes back at the top of his game, and I highly recommend Asteroid City if you didn't give it a chance this year. All right, with that, we are done with the honorable mentions. Moving on to my number 10 film of the year. It would be so easy. Not everybody gets this job. All right, coming in at number 10 is Infinity Pool, directed by Brandon Cronenberg, starring Mia Goth and Alexander Skarsgård. This is my favorite horror film of the year. I think uh, this is super creative. Some of the best visual effects of the year. There's a scene, I think, towards the first act of this movie. It's been a long time since I've seen it, a little bit over a year, but um, I, I still really love it. It still is sticking in my brain. There's a scene towards the first act, I believe, where um, there's so many colorful images and it gets very creative, very out there. There are some scenes in the third act as well that are similar. I just really, really love the visual effects in this movie. I think it explores so many interesting ideas. Definitely a lot of sci-fi elements to this horror story as well. And I think Brandon Cronenberg just really knocked it out of the park with this film. So Infinity Pool is number 10. Hey, focus. This is how it went. No, it's different now. Do you want to share your discussion with the class? Sorry, no. Okay, because you just made yourself the target by speaking when you weren't supposed to. You get the analogy? I get the analogy. Okay, good. My number nine pick is Dream Scenario, starring Nicolas Cage, directed by Christopher Borgley. This film just recently checked out uh, incredible performance from Nicolas Cage. It's a hilarious movie. It's got, once again, some really fun sci-fi elements to it. A creative story, unique, different, and I really love the performances, and I think the comedy hit home most of the time, so I really enjoy Dream Scenario. Uh, definitely give it a recommendation. If you haven't seen it, go check it out. Generosity conceals something dirtier and meaner. You're incapable of facing your ambitions, and you resent me for it, but I'm not the one who put you where you are. I have nothing to do with it. You're not sacrificing yourself, as you say. You choose to sit on the sidelines because you're afraid. My number eight pick is Anatomy of a Fall. Uh, Anatomy of a Fall, French uh, drama from Justine Trier. Uh, it stars Sandra Huller as uh, the main character. And uh, it's a film that's about half in French, half in English. So it's kind of a good bridge for those of you who struggle with uh, foreign films. But um, I think it does the courtroom drama super well. This film is not necessarily the most inventive in the world. 
to me, this is all about execution. Uh, this film is executed phenomenally well. The dialogue is fantastic. Super happy that the script got nominated for an Oscar, uh, as well as Sandra Huller in the lead role. I think she was definitely deserving. And it approaches the murder mystery in a, a great way, in my opinion. It doesn't spoon feed you information. Uh, it forces you to actively think about the film and whether or not you think the person is guilty. So I really appreciated the film for all those reasons. Comes in at number eight. Hi, Barbie. Oh, hi, Alan. There are no multiples of Alan. He's just Alan. Yeah, I'm, I'm confused about that. My number seven pick is Barbie. Of course, the movie of the year, highest grossing film of the year, most talked about film of the year. Where to start with Barbie? <laughs> so I've given my thoughts in depth on this movie many times uh, throughout the summer. Of course, the Barbenheimer uh, phenomenon <laughs> that happened over the summer was fantastic. I loved seeing all the excitement at the movie theater. And as somebody who is absolutely not the target demographic for Barbie, you know, I'm a single 27-year-old dude. <laughs> I'm definitely not the target audience here, but I love the movie nonetheless. I think it has so many important things to say about feminism and women's rights and how women are treated in society, and it does it in such a funny way. That being said, there's a couple nitpicks that I have with the film couple things that kind of held it back in terms of plot direction and all of the different kind of storylines that they try to meld together. I'm not necessarily sure that I would nominate America Ferrara for her role. I think outside of her main monologue, she was kind of okay. Not necessarily her fault. I think it's more of the fault of the writing for that character. But that being said, I had so much fun at the theater at Barbie. Definitely the most fun time that I've had at the theater this year. And for that reason, it's definitely got to find a place in my top 10. Man, that oil which should go to her sister as your wife. Well, he's taking money that by right should go to Molly. My number six pick, the new epic film from Martin Scorsese, Killers of the Flower Moon. This is a film that I was super stoked for the second that uh, I knew about it, of course. We were waiting quite a while for this film, as we do for many Scorsese movies these days. That being said, uh, this film is epic in every sense of the word. Slightly slow when it comes to the runtime. Three and a half hours is a little bit pushing it, but it, uh, it really does deserve that runtime. It just could be trimmed down just a little bit to make it a little more fast-paced. It does feel little bit of a slog to get through. However, it's anchored by some phenomenal performances. Lily Gladstone is by far the best of the bunch. She is so, so good in this movie, and she's slightly understated. It's not a particularly showy performance, but it's such a good performance, and it's emotionally resonant, and I loved her in the film. I will not be heartbroken if she wins the Oscar for this. Uh, I think it's an important story that definitely needs to be told. I think as Americans, we all know the ugly history of European colonization uh, against the Native Americans. But I think along with myself, many Americans did not know this particular story. So it's an important story to be told. And uh, I think it's told very well here by Scorsese and definitely deserving of all the accolades. So Killers of the Flower Moon is my number six. It's my birthday. Oh, well, happy birthday, young man. Well, let's get you a slice of cake or some other age-appropriate dessert. Christ on a crutch. What kind of a fascist hash foundry are you running here? All right, we're into the top five. Now, the top five is so, so close. I think all of these movies are either nearly perfect or perfect. Uh, and really, these movies are elite, in my opinion. Uh, number five is The Holdovers. Stars Paul Giamatti and directed by Alexander Payne. This movie is, once again, kind of like Barbie, so much fun, but for different reasons. This is the most heartwarming, wholesome film of my top 10, and it's perfect for the holiday season when I watched it, and it's definitely kind of advertised as a holiday season movie as well. Uh, if you consider this a Christmas movie, it's my second favorite Christmas movie of all time. It's fantastic. Paul Giamatti delivers a phenomenal performance. Davine Joy Randolph is also phenomenal. She is absolutely deserving of every accolade that she gets for this one. And it, it's just a powerful, emotional story 
that's also really funny as well. And it kind of balances that perfectly. It balances the humor and the drama. And it, it also delivers that, you know, emotional payoff with the connection, kind of the odd connection between these three main characters. And uh, I just really adore the whole Close look. knit here on the island and you kind of recognize everyone. I know there was a point when he was friendlier with Georgie, but I didn't really meet him until he came to the pet store looking for a job. It was summer after sixth grade? Seventh. Seventh. Mm -hmm. and then Coming in at number four is May, December. The newest film from Todd Haynes stars Natalie Portman, Julianne Moore, and Charles Melton, who is the serious breakthrough out of this film. I had no idea what Charles Melton was capable of. I had no idea who he was <laughs> before the movie. And he blew me away, just like he's blown away most people that have seen this film. I think uh, Todd Haynes is really showing off in this movie. I think if you'd have given this script to most directors, I think this film would have felt really in poor taste. But Todd Haynes knows exactly what he's doing. This is a very difficult subject matter to deal with. It deals with sexual abuse. Um, and I think it does so in a delicate way, but it also is super creative and unique and odd. <laughs> this film is just so bizarre, but I really liked liked it, especially the more that I've thought about it. The more that this film has sat with me, the higher it's crept up the list. I think this film is something super special. And Charles Melton's performance is so key to understanding the film. You really feel the film through him and his character. And uh, I think he absolutely knocked this out of the park. So May, December, one of my favorites of the year. Definitely highly recommended if you haven't seen it yet. 그리고 내가 너 좋아하는 이유는 네가 너이기 때문이야. 그리고 넌 누구냐면 떠나는 사람인 거야. My number three pick, Past Lives. One of my absolute favorites, of course. This was my favorite movie of the year for a long portion of the year. It came out back in the summer. And I remember from the very first time I saw it, I fell in love with this movie. This is the debut feature from Celine Song. It stars uh, Greta Lee and Teo Yu as the main characters, as well as John Majaro in a fantastic supporting role. This is a small movie. It is low budget and it's a very small scale story. It deals with uh, Teo Yu and Greta Lee's characters, they form a friendship and a childhood relationship back home in South Korea. And then Greta Lee's character immigrates with her parents to Canada and then I believe the United States later on. And it really explores this idea of, you know, the different paths that you can go on in life and kind of this idea of unexplored options in such a great way and it's emotional, it hits, it's a gorgeous looking movie. It tells the story in such a beautiful way. It's got a phenomenal score. It's a perfect film, in my opinion. These top three are all perfect, uh, but Past Lives is gonna come in at number three because the other two were just slightly better, in my opinion. But yeah, Past Lives, one of my absolute favorites of the year. Highly recommend it. The bomb had more power than 20,000 tons of TNT. My number two film of the year, Oppenheimer. This is uh, the front runner to win Best Picture. I will not be heartbroken if it wins. I think technically speaking, this is the best film of the year. When it comes to the technical elements, the scripts, the direction, the performances, this film has it all. It's got amazing lead performance from Killian Murphy. Definitely Oscar worthy right there. I mean, just his facial expressions alone in the film were Oscar worthy. Robert Downey Jr. delivers an Oscar worthy supporting performance. Uh, Emily Blunt is also really solid in the film and Christopher Nolan delivering his best film so far. And this film to me connects emotionally in a way that most Christopher Nolan films do not. The only film I could really compare this to emotion wise when it comes to Nolan is um, perhaps a little bit of Inception, but mostly Interstellar. And I think this film blows both of them out of the water when it comes to the emotional impact. 
it really wrestles with this idea of nuclear weapons in a fantastic way. Um, it explores the morality of it, the morality of what Oppenheimer did, the weight, the emotional weight that must have been on Oppenheimer after creating that weapon. Uh, it is phenomenal. It has some of the best scenes of the year, some of the best performances of the year, an absolute incredible score. Visual effects are fantastic. It's not an action movie. It's very dialogue heavy, but it feels like an action movie. And uh, to me, this is a phenomenal roller coaster. It earns every minute of those three hours. And it is by far, I think, technically one of the best of the year. Uh, the best of the year, my bad. But there was one movie that I personally enjoyed just slightly more than Oppenheimer. So that will be my number one in just a minute. Discovered my whoring. I find myself merely jealous of the men's time with you rather than any moral aspersion against you. It is your body, Bella Baxter, yours to give freely. I generally charge 30 francs. Well, that seems low. And of course, my number one pick, my favorite movie of 2023 was Poor Things. Like I said, I think technically speaking, Oppenheimer is slightly better than Poor Things. However, Poor Things was my personal favorite. It was the most fun that I had in a theater this past year was watching Poor Things. Uh, I think Yorgos Lanthimos is a master and I will see every single one of his films. I've basically said that since I watched The Lobster, which was my first film of his. I think he is one of the most creative, unique directors working in Hollywood today. Uh, with that being said, however, Melanthimos is very known for his dry, witty dialogue. There is that, but it feels a little bit more toned down. I think that's probably because Melanthimos did not write this film himself. However, even though he has directed movies he hasn't written in the past, they've still had that Melanthimos feel. And this does have a Lanthimos feel, but it's not nearly as intense as some of his other work. And I think that makes it a bit more approachable. The whole film is centered upon an incredible performance from um, Emma Stone, who just fades away into the character of Bella Baxter. And you see the, the whole film and the whole world through her eyes. It has the best production design of the year, in my opinion. It's so gorgeous to look at. Uh, the set design, the building of the sets, and creating this mystical, magical world that Bella lives in is so amazing. Willem Dafoe and Mark Ruffalo deliver some of the best performances, supporting-wise, of the year. And, of course, Emma Stone delivers one of the best performances overall of the year. A very smart, witty script with uh, also incredibly creative cinematography. It is the most creative cinematography of the year. Um, I don't know if it's necessarily the best. Uh, I would lean towards it, but it is definitely the most creative and off the wall. There's so many different camera angles, different shots, uh, types of shots, etc. And then also a really weird, crazy score that is just permeating throughout the entire film and is so perfect for the film and its subject matter. So I'm going to kind of wrap up my thoughts. Poor Things is my movie of the year for 2023. Go ahead and let me know in the comments down below what your favorite movies of the year are. I hope you enjoyed my list. This is always a very fun video to make uh, every year. So excited to kind of wrap up 2023, put a bow on uh, the best movies of 2023. All right, we will continue with this week and this weekend with some other Oscar content. I will be ranking the best Oscar, uh, or sorry, the best picture nominees. I will be ranking in my preference from one to 10. I will also be doing my predictions as well as my own movie awards. And then when we get to Sunday night, my reaction to the ceremony. So I'm very much looking forward to this week. It's gonna be so much fun. Hope you guys are as well. Definitely subscribe if you haven't already to stay tuned for these upcoming videos. And I hope you all have an amazing evening. See you guys later.